Before you, you see a bunch of numbers. Relative risk, vaccine efficacy, absolute risk reduction, and the infamous NNV numbers needed to vaccinate. This may not make sense to a majority of the individuals looking at this for the first time, especially our well enlightened data analytic crew. But however, though, it will make sense in a second. We are going to touch base on two extremely hot topics. One, vaccine efficacy, especially in result, or I should say in reference to absolute risk reduction. Second, the research recently released from MIT in reference to indoor capacity and mask use. Two extremely hot topics. I am not going to have a desire to elaborate too much in basically acknowledging potential censorship risk. But however, though, I will lead you to information that will basically enlighten you in reference to what a few of these um, references mean, as well as the MIT research or supplemental research, which is hidden in, not hidden, but linked in the full research study itself, so you can reference. But first, it is April 25th, 1236 AM. Let us get right into the research as follows. First one as we go. COVID-19 vaccine, efficacy and effectiveness, the elephant not in the room. I am going to take some excerpts. Hopefully it does not create a bias, but I'm going to read you directly from the research itself. Nothing more, but a little bit less because I can't redo the whole thing. Furthermore, excerpts of these results have been widely communicated and debated through the press release and media, sometimes in misleading ways. Although attention has focused on vaccine efficacy and comparing the reduction of the number of symptomatic cases fully, symptomatic cases, forgive me, Fully understanding the efficacy and effectiveness of vaccines is less straightforward than it might seem. Depending on how the effect size is expressed, a quite different picture might emerge. And it does. Numbers needed to vaccinate, focus on that. This link right here is fairly important, and that is going to be right here. But we'll reference that in a few seconds. So as we scroll down, what we're going to notice is this in particular. All right. Although the relative risk reduction, RRR, let's start right here. However, relative risk reduction should not be seen against the background risk of infected and becoming ill with COVID-19, which varies between populations and over time. Although the relative risk reduction considers only participants who could benefit from the vaccine, the absolute risk reduction, ARR, which is the difference between attack rates. Attack rate sounds very hostile, but attack rates we're looking at a length of time. With and without a vaccine considers the whole population. ARRs tend to be ignored because they give much less impressive effect size than relative risk reduction. Here we go. One to 3% for the AstraZeneca Oxford. 1 to 2% for the Moderna. 1 to 2% for the Johnson & Johnson. 0.93% for the Gamalea. 084 for the Pfizer vaccine. All right. This is where the confusion is going to set in because we're looking at the absolute risk reduction for the general population as a whole. To proceed, there are many lessons. Let's, let's go here. Ba, 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 ba. All right. The explanation lies in the combination of vaccine efficacy and different background risk of COVID-19 across studies, which we just covered. There are many lessons to learn from the way studies are conducted and results are presented with the use of only relative risk reductions and omitting omitting ARR, which is your absolute risk reduction, reporting bias is introduced. You hear me often refer that word as publisher bias, selection bias, confirmation bias, bias galore, which affects the interpretation of vaccine efficacy. 
When communicating about vaccine efficacy, especially for public health decisions such as choosing the type of vaccine to purchase and deploy, having full picture of what data actually show is important and ensuring comparisons are based upon the combined evidence that put vaccine trial results in context and not just looking at one summary measure, i.e. relative risk reduction. It is also important such decisions should be properly informed by detailed understanding of study results requiring access to full data sets in an independent scrutiny and analysis. As you can automatically tell, I'm kind of frustrated. Now, what we are going to go, here let's read a little further down to Study population, background risk, blah, 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 COVID-19, or study duration, exposure, different definitions, population, da, 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 I'm reading kind of fast. Importantly, we are left with unanswered questions to whether a vaccine with a given efficacy in the study population will have the same efficacy in another population. With different levels of background risk of COVID-19, this is not a trivial question because transmission intensity varies between countries affected by other factors such as public health interventions and virus variants. The only reported indication of vaccine effectiveness is the Israeli mass vaccination campaign using the Pfizer BioNTech product. All of the design and methodology are radically different from the randomized trial. Dagan and colleagues report an RR of 94%, which essentially is the same as the RR of the phase three trial, but with absolute risk reduction of 0.46%. Remember, number needed to vaccinate, which translates into number needed to vaccinate of 217, 217. I, to elaborate on numbers needed to vaccinate, there's a really good research article right here. It is defined as the number of persons needed to vaccinate in order to prevent one outcome. All right. I'll link this up. Uh, good explanation of what NNNV is because in Wikipedia, it has a horrible definition of numbers you need to vaccinate. This older study gives a great explanation of why it is and why it's used for those not familiar. To respond, translates into a number needed to vaccinate of 217, meaning 217 individuals need to be vaccinated in order to prevent one positive case. Now, here's the other issue involved. A good portion of the positive cases are asymptomatic. So keep that in mind too. All right, when the AR of 0.84 and the number needed to vaccine was 119 in the phase three trial, which we're gonna reference those numbers. This means in a real life setting, 1.8 times more subjects might be needed to be vaccinated to prevent one more case of COVID-19 than predicted in the corresponding clinical trial. Here we proceed ahead. Again, I'm reading, uh, Perbatim quite a bit because I don't want to veer off course in order to mitigate the opportunity for censorship. Uncoordinated phase three trials do not satisfy public health requirement platforms trial designed to address public health relevant questions in common protocol, which allow decisions to be made, informed by common criteria and uniform assessment. These considerations on efficacy and effectiveness are based on studies measuring prevention to mild to moderate COVID-19 infection. They were not designed to conclude on prevention of hospitalization. Repeat, and I'm gonna reiterate this. Not designed to conclude on prevention of hospitalization, severe disease or death or on prevention of infection and transmission potential. Assessing the suitability of vaccines must consider all indicators and involve safety, deployability, availability, and cost. Now we're gonna to go to supplemental information. This is also why too, you can postulate why so much of the demand to continue wearing masks after being vaccinated is called for. Because a lot of what they're doing is what's referred to as post-marketing surveillance. Vaccinate first, find out what happens later. That is about as far off course as I'm going to veer. Now we are going to go to the supplement information. And then I'm going to go to the data. And then we're going to back, head back to the news articles itself. All right, here we are. Now you see what this number this means. Numbers needed to vaccinate. Now keep in mind, this is used in the phase three trial information. So when you see 119, for example, I apologize about that. And there it goes, 119 for the Pfizer. With the Israeli studies, what do they show? 
the Israeli study showed, according to data here, was about 217. So we're going to give it the benefit of the doubt. We are going to use the reported NNV, numbers you need to vaccinate, as in the phase three trial, as opposed to the 217 in the real world setting. Why is that important? Well, one thing you may be able to consider is why it may be important is because of relative risk. When the relative risk, and this is where post-marketing surveillance comes into play, when the relative risk begins to outweigh the actual benefit, you have some additional factors to consider. And I'm going to reiterate that or repeat. When the relative risk, such as potential side effects, so on and so forth, begins to be greater in the population than preventing the potential outcome, then other considerations have to come into play, especially when something may be experimental. Here we go. I'm going to basically use a little bit of math. Here's our data presented. I'm going to pull the CDC data, the submission dates, for example, as here, total cases, so on and so forth. What we are going to do is we are going to build a data frame based upon the total cases. So we're just going to sum, for those people in data analytics, we're summing all the total cases. Then we are going to go to healthdata.gov. And what we're going to pull here is basically the previous day emission in COVID confirmed cases. I made an error in one of my other uh, data frames, which I finally discovered tonight why I was making that error, because I was looking at hospital admissions, but I was totaling up the totals at each day goes on and end up with a massive number. So you see that number right there? Previous day admissions we have right there, 2,183,071. So that's working off each state and that's worked off the admissions of adult confirmed cases. Now, here's the other thing to take into account. The vulnerability of each group. Now we're considering the vulnerability of all age groups here, I assume in the phase three trial. Now, if you look at the vulnerability, for example, in younger individuals, teenagers, school children, and so on and so forth, that NNV has to skyrocket. But I do not want to, that's a hypothesis of mine, and that could interject publisher bias. However, though, for the biostatisticians out there and the epidemiologists, now that we have this information presented to us from the Lancet, we can make rational choices. But to proceed, here we go. Number of the vaccinated, this each one. And I had like only 15 minutes prior to this, so please excuse the um, uh, the data presentation as these bar charts were set. It's kind of, I just had to rush. So for example, here's Pfizer, 119, need to prevent one outcome. Moderna, 81, to prevent one outcome. The Gamaleya, 108, to prevent one outcome. Johnson & Johnson, 84, which is interesting because you hear the relative risk reduction being less but however, though, in the absolute risk reduction, it actually has 84 cases to prevent one. Interesting. AstraZeneca, the Oxford vaccine, same thing. So if you look at this aspect of the ARR, ARR or absolute risk reduction, you actually have a higher yield of performance than, for example, here. But again, uh, this is the data at hand. I'm not going to say more than that because... I don't want to end up in a lawsuit between here, here, or here. Even though we have a very small group of maybe 70 people that watch the videos, regardless, these videos are extremely important to those who do watch. Absolute risk reduction, there's the numbers right there. Numbers needed to vaccinate to prevent one hospitalization. All right, this is where the information I showed you comes into play. What we did is this. All right, so we took the CDC data. All right, we took the admissions. All we did basically is we took basically the hospitalizations to the totals for each state, and then we need a percentage of 6.87%. So then you take 100 divided by 6.87, and you multiply, I think, by 14.55, and then you get the number needed to vaccinate to prevent one hospitalization. So the reason we're doing the hospitalization as opposed to the outcome of a positive case is because, again, the population uh, selection. One is a large percentage of the population that may end up with a positive outcome, uh, may be asymptomatic. And the true objective was basically to flatten the curve, and so to say. So flatten the curve was a reduced hospitalization. 
if you have something like the cytomegalovirus, virus, which you can have an infection with, but no one even knows they have it, uh, because most people are asymptomatic to cytomegalovirus, viruses, then, then why bother with lockdowns, pandemic mitigation strategies, and so on and so forth, if it's a virus that no one even knows they have, and you have no negative outcome or response to it. So this is what we have here. Every 1,731 individuals, according to a very, very, very basic math model, which I just put together, I'm sure it's going to change because it's transmission rates, you know, pandemic mitigation strategies, mask wearing, so forth, and distancing, washing. There's a lot of variables that are involved. So this is just real basic uh, for an epidemiologist out there or a biostatistician, which has better skills than I. Uh, please feel free to chime in and readjust these numbers. So for every 1,731 vaccinations, you may prevent one hospitalization and you follow through accordingly in reference to the sets. And, but this is basically in the hospitalizations based upon the current hospitalization rate. Also keep in mind too, this includes everything from May of 2020. So this number even may be higher since there seems to be a higher transmissibility, but a lower uh, negative outcome or people don't get as sick. It appears as time moves forward. Uh, regardless, so keep that in mind. So 1,731 vaccines, vaccinations to prevent one hospitalization. Again, now you go back to your relative risk as far as potential uh, adverse effects to a vaccine, uh, reference CDC or VAERS. And if that relative risk begins to overweigh the outcome, uh, then yeah, you have uh, policy decisions that have to be uh, really revisited. And I'm talking really revisit. Even at this case in a phase three in the most the best light, seriously, uh, yeah, there needs to be some heavy revisiting. And again, I'm just dumbfounded by the aspect that policymakers, decision makers, individuals in the media, they all can do exactly what I'm doing here on a Sunday night in 10 to 15 minutes. And I'm dismayed and disheartened that it's not being done. And of course, I'm doing it. I'm sure that's there's much, much better qualified individuals to do it and that can have a great, much greater amount of influence. But since no one else is doing it, no one else is putting the numbers together and even Lancet produces an article like that, it doesn't make the media. Um, you know, everyone just sits and we just stare into the air and go, why is this not being picked up? But here we are. For those with the channel, I am grateful that you're watching the channel and now you know. The information will be linked if for your policy decision makers in reference to hospitals and other uh, educational facilities and so on and so forth, especially the colleges inside California, which are mandating uh, this very, very, at this point in time, superfluous uh, mitigation strategy. Uh, you know, it's there for you. All right. And just as a bonus, it is about when was our president inaugurated, Biden, on January 20th. And he said, give us 100 days to mask, not forever, 100 days. Well, the countdown is about over. President Biden's 100-day promise has 100 days. 95 days have passed, five days are remaining. Let's see if Biden holds up to that promise or President Biden holds up to that promise. So by next week, we'll see if he alleviates the federal mask mandate uh, for you know, government institutions per se. All right, now let's get right into the next aspect of the next article we're reviewing. We are going to be reviewing, do, 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 there's that, there's that. And also to another great article, which I'm going to link as well, uh, relative risk, relative and absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat. Uh, just so you can, you don't have to try, I don't want to be trusted. Uh, I know that sounds wrong, but it's like, you know, I, I want to, if you can understand the information, uh, counter me as far as understanding the data which I'm pulling uh, to doubt me to have a great appreciation. In fact, the greater you doubt me, I'm sure the greater the appreciation for the data that we pull uh, because you begin to really understand what these researchers are doing. And there are a lot of great researchers out there. It's just that for whatever reason, uh, due to the mass, mass hysteria of selection bias, it's not being picked up and I don't know why, but here we go. Next one we go is, we may have seen this and we'll start with this one real fast. Well, let's, let's give credit where credit's due. All 
All right. First we have here is MIT researchers say you're no safer from COVID indoors at six feet or 60 feet in a new study challenging social distancing policies. And I'm going to take an excerpt and then we're going to go into the research itself. This is from, of course, CNBC of all places. You wouldn't think so, but they have the information there. This is not an argument against mask use. This is MIT uh, saying about room occupancy and how masks can actually create a dynamic which can, how would you say, counter a possible distancing or rule hypothesis. The reason why is as follows. Quote, we argue there really isn't much of a benefit to the six foot rule, especially when people are wearing masks. Paradox. It is really has it really has no physical basis because the air a person is breathing while wearing a mask tends to rise. It comes down elsewhere in the room, so you're more exposed to the average background than you are to a person at a distance. Immediately What's going to be countered in reference to the hypothesis that basically MIT is presenting here is they are going to go into say, well, if a mask is fitted properly, you wouldn't have to do that. But let's take into account real world scenarios and tell you quite honestly, people with beards, facial hair, mask, just walk into your average big store and I guarantee uh, you're not going to find everyone uh, adhering to proper mask fitting rules. And we're going to go to the next article in reference before we actually go to the research articles as follows. Limiting the capacity of bars is the same research article. Uh, please forgive all the ad pop-ups, but again, uh, give credit where credit's due. Limiting the capacity of bars and restaurants is nothing to cut the risk of catching COVID-19. Repeat, limiting the capacity of bars and restaurants says nothing. It is now April 25th, 2021. And now this surfaces. New research claims. The last three aspects right here. The model of time spent indoors was found to put people at risk at most risk. And the reason to bring this information to light is because, again, you're hearing a lot more about ventilation, filtration, UVC light, and so on and so forth. The trick is they're saying it doesn't really make a difference. Work more towards better ventilation in order to keep that risk down. Especially now, you have states trying to make masks mandatory for good in business settings. Not based upon actual hard science, but based upon conjecture because it sounds good. Albeit you may prevent people from spitting on each other directly, it doesn't mean that spits are going to stay up in the air forever. Quote, this is because when people breathe while wearing masks, droplets rise. The droplets then travel through a room and come back in a different area. And as far as basically reiterating, they did a great job on the information. Um, a, lot of, a lot of places have actually done a great job, and they've come to the same conclusion over and over again. In a lab, you know, masks obviously do what they're supposed to do. But however, in real world settings, different things occur. The team says the six foot rule has no physical basis because when people are wearing masks, because air tends to rise, travel and come back down somewhere else in the room. So if you don't have a mask on, yeah, you may have a horizontal con uh, projection of basically whatever, uh, airborne droplets. But however, though, once a mask is on, if it's not fitted appropriately per se, then it's gonna rise. Uh, Basically, they go through the models because there's not much benefit. There's no physical basis. Uh, it goes to microscope. Olympic drops are released while breathing, talking, coughing, other respiratory factors, body heat. And the droplets can rise and travel through the entire room. And as you go through and you read the area excerpt, uh, the risk of being exposed to the coronavirus indoors is the same as socially distancing six feet and 60 feet apart, according to MIT. And so basically... That is a real interesting aspect. And the part of, if you read through the research they brought up, uh, I want to basically see if there's any more tidbits of information I want to pull up here. Uh, they based it upon models where they were finding that people were, that were catching and showing a positive of COVID weren't people that were basically, especially they use an example of a bus or airborne transmission. Uh, the people that were getting sick 
weren't the people that were sitting next to the person who was the carrier uh, per se. There are people getting sick in different parts of the bus, the back of the bus, the front of the bus, but not necessarily people sitting next to the person. So that's where the question of distancing began to take, uh, take hold because if the distancing aspect was primary, then you would expect when the data is an al an al uh, analyzed that the closer individuals were to the person who was infected, the greater the risk of infection. And that's where the confounding began to arise and they wanted to look at that information. That's the great part, this is the research article, but however though, I really recommend you don't go from this aspect here. There's a lot more, I don't wanna say more interesting because that's being, it's, it's all of it's incredibly intriguing. But the supplemental information, that's what I want you to, if you get an opportunity to go through and link and read through, it is beautifully well thought out information. It is not, again, you know I'm not a fan of mask use per se. I know it's submicronized. I know we looked at studies in reference to um, low airflow and nose droplet uh, deposition per se and possibly raising risk of infection because of lower airflow in the mask itself. Exercising issues, issues which you discovered in VO2 max being dropped by 29% last week. And two weeks was prior to that, uh, exercise reference to people exercising with mask on causing lactic acid buildup and causing heart irregularities, especially that with individuals with other comorbidities. Please forgive me, I know I'm speaking fast, but again, I want to, I want to keep this down within an hour. Uh, so, you know, the data which I reviewed personally, uh, per se, that basically colors my opinion. Uh, but to keep so, I want to reiterate, out of respect for the researchers, this is not an argument against the mask itself. This is an argument against limiting the capacity of bars and the reason being that masks cause vapors to rise and therefore carry across the room and if you don't have proper ventilation, then that may raise the risk of individuals catching the virus, which is an interesting aspect overall, because uh, when you issue shelter in place, uh, pandemic guidelines or enforcement, you begin to say, hey, well, maybe all the people that you're forcing to stay indoors, you know, what about that? Again, that could be conjecture, publisher bias, but it's definitely a hypothesis which order to be investigated. All right, with that in mind, let's go right into the data as follows. Here we go. Are we ready? There's our Biden's 100 day promise. We have five days remaining. It is, so we're looking at April 30th. And again, so let's see if he holds that. If, let's see if he remembers that promise. Not trying to be condescending, but I haven't heard him mention one thing about the 100 day promise recently. And that's what he said. And I'm gonna hold him to it. And just like, for example, the 15 day thing, being over by Easter last year, being over by Christmas, uh, I'm just, you know, I bureaucrats tend to enjoy the world of uncertainty because again, here we are. All right, so let us begin with the data as follows. Let's begin over here. Are you ready? Hotspots. All right, last time we looked at basically these three hotspots in the area, but now what, what happened was we have decent controls. All right, if you notice all the greens, these are the areas where I'm gonna say the pandemic mitigation uh, measures are light, uh, where there may not be a mask mandate. New Hampshire just, remember we, it was just added to that list. I think they dropped the mask mandate April 16th. And we're not attempting to say they're healthier or not healthier. We're trying to see if there's any correlation between mask mandates and transmission of the disease as follows. So here we are April 15th. And do you notice anything? They dropped and now give it the benefit of doubt. It may take a few to eight to 10 days or whatever it is for uh, transmission to infection that begin to surface. But at this point in time, in the short duration, 
since now actually you know what it's been nine days you should start seeing higher infection levels by now shouldn't you do you i don't know i don't see it there it is uh new cases per hundred thousand da 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 there it is da, da, da. new hampshire does have a little higher aspect on that end but really they're heading at the same trajectory as everyone else uh case the hospitalizations uh vermont again is the hot spot they require a mask and new hampshire doesn't so again and there's also collateral effects to re reference that mask as well going up the scale here what are we looking at now we are looking at michigan michigan this is on the same y-axis and this is cases per hundred thousands we are comparing apples to apples remember wisconsin is walled in by two high infection states which require masks there we are i don't need words the data does all the speaking all right, and here we go again. Next one. Then let's, well, let's look down. Da, 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 da. Ah, we're running out of time, but you get an idea. Michigan really is not doing well, and they are really, really not doing something right. So here we go. And da, 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 what's the next one? Minnesota. Minnesota, here, here. Bum, bum, bum. All right, what do we got here? Minnesota is still kind of spiking on the cases per 100,000. Neighboring states that do not require masks. North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin. How are they doing? This is cases per 100,000, so we are comparing apple to apples. Oh, it looks like they're faring better. All right, let's go back up the last here. This is just the charts if you want to see if you can find your information there. I'm going to see if there's anything interesting real fast. This is where I made an error uh, because I was going to case the hospitalization uh, smooth, but I should have been going through admission rates and then totaling those. So I'll fix this next time. All right. This is what we're looking at here. Green, loose states with low pandemic or light pandemic mitigation versus white states, tight states, which have heavy pandemic mitigation strategies or rules, laws, or whatever Machiavellian terminology you want to utilize. Boom. There it is. Right there is your data. All right. COVID hospitalizations per 100,000 smooth. COVID hospitalization smooth. Green, loose, white, tight. Here we are right here. Uh, we are looking at hospitalizations per 100,000. That's the larger scale. They were doing worse for quite some time, but not anymore. I.e. dysbiosis. Here we go. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da Please forgive me. I'm scrolling fast. I need to get this done in the next 15 minutes. Not that I want to rush, but my time is limited because I have an obligation I have to go through. Go to. Uh, even though it's 1, oh, it's 7 a.m. All right, here we are. And then new cases moved per 100,000. There we are. Doo -doo -doo. What are we looking at right here? We are looking at new deaths per 100,000 smooth. Again, green, loose, white, tight. There you are. They're neck and neck. That's the way it is. Again, that's with all the social distancing, indoor dining being restricted, so on and so forth. All of that extra work and effort and in the end, there's a song that has a saying that it doesn't really matter. And that's criminal. Uh, so again, I'm a big data person. I know the effort and the intention, but the data is data. Here we go. Uh, you can say conflation, confounding, confirmation, bias, Dunning-Kruger, whatever the heck you want to say. But regardless of that, numbers are numbers. Here we are. And this is basically green, green loose states versus white tight state, new deaths per 100,000 rolling. They always a little closer. We looked at the bigger graph before, neck and neck. All right, so, but the worst part about it's this. You, when you look at the white line, it doesn't show you the other factors, such as delayed hospitalization, delayed diagnosis, uh, lack of access to mental health care facilities, so on and so forth. So this only shows one part of the information where the green uh, doesn't have that collateral aspect to it with the white. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. Again, the, I, I don't know. Here we go. And I couldn't rationalize what they are thinking. Green, loose states versus white states. Death per thousand. That's the bigger graph. Da, da, da. Cases, cases. All right. New case per 100,000. 132 is the mean, or for those not familiar, is the average in the tight states. Uh, 101 in the loose states. Right there, numbers speak volumes. Uh, this is information coming from the CDC. So we'll revert, go get that in a second. There's a crossover. That's when the changes began. Uh, 
and then we're, that, I don't know if I can use the word herd mentality. But keep in mind, if an individual gets COVID, hypothetically, it's supposedly if the second time or third time they're exposed to it, the, the, it gets less. What is this? This is new cases per 100,000. This is white states versus green states. Yeah. That's the biggest gap I've seen so far. Why did I almost pass over that? Please forgive me. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's green. Green, again, is loose. White is tight restrictions. Draconian laws, whatever you want to call it, you know, Machiavellian aspect of some sort of warp mount, uh, Munchausen? Munchausen disorder. And, of course, populations being eternally locked in Stockholm Syndrome, where they say, hey, vaccinate us and everything will open up. But, however, though, looking at vaccine efficacy, that's Stockholm Syndrome. All right, so here we go. Ba, 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 going up, 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 up. Hospitalization rates, remember that, flattened curve. We're going to be running out of ventilators. How many times can they have been wrong and still be there? And so this eternal state of emergency really seriously has got to end. There's no, I can't see a rationale when we have controls, and those control states, are, uh, which are loose restrictions and no pandemic mitigation uh, uh, aspects, are doing far better than or at least equal as basically lockdown states. To move forward, I don't think I'd be censored for that. So let's go, let's look at our Monte Carlo. All right, here we are, new current deaths in the United States. It's dropping down. Now remember though, that we had a massive drop prior to the vaccines being launched. So be cautious. I mean, I don't want to do the same thing too. I am just as guilty in my perception to be warped as well as falling victim to selection bias. That's why I don't mind having people give me different dimensions on certain problems. All right, so there we are, ba ba bomb world data. What are we looking at? Your cases to mortality. Red line is your mortality, and there's your cases. Remember, we had a lot of high case transmissions, but mortality really never changed, but they keep unlocking everyone freaking down. Uh, mortality per million, ba ba bomb The question is, again, if you keep on if you have a multiple choice test and, for example, the answer out of one out of ten is five, or I guess the number in my head and the number is five, you know, you cannot keep on guessing the same number. And then the worst part about it, if the cases rise, they say, oh, we're not being strict enough. And if the cases go down, they take credit for it because they say, look, we won. You can't do that. That's not science. That's superstition. There could be a natural ebb and flow, especially since we do have controls, and those controls do not show uh, premise in reference to the hypothesis that they're presenting. All right, we go back up. Asia, for example, cases per million shared on the y-axis. Even though we do have an increase, remember we keep on hearing about India and India. Look at that. That's deaths. Deaths did rise. There are 2,000, and that's pretty substantial. Why? I don't know. Compared to basically the other areas in South America, South America is still higher than Asia. And Asia has a population of 4.4 billion, 463 million. All right, here we go. Ba -ba, ba -ba, just going backwards. Look how Africa dropped. That's amazing. Uh, you, just Africa and North America kind of followed the same path. All right, there is our, there is our Asia, the Asian friends. And let's just go up, 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 up. Let's go to the United States. There's, look at that. Look at that. That's cases, not mortality cases. And I discovered that too, because when, when we go look at India, uh, an interesting aspect is India did has done far more testing, which obviously correlated with, we'll look at a second, more cases. Surprise, surprise. But then the mortality right here, mortality percentage has gone down. Because obviously if you're testing more and you come up with more positive cases, but the mortality is lower, then obviously you're going to end up with this number. This is not India. This is the world as a whole. All right. And looking at that, that, heat maps, da, da, da. That's the world. See, this is when the vaccines began to kick in. All right. Right now, that, 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 that percentage of the globe is vaccinated. We do have a rise, but you can't take credit for the vaccines. When it goes down, then it goes up. So it's just a correlation. I don't, I don't think it has any premise on it at this current time. And there's the mortality, United States versus India. Now, weird thing about the news and the media, they, they start doing this weird conjecture thing about bodies in the streets and things like that in reference to India. Um, the data, though, I don't know. All right, there's one spike. 
believe that that was Armenia or not. We'll check that out later on. Uh, deaths in Sweden, to USA. We look at that. Uh, da, 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 that is safe. Yeah, it's not, it's not comparing apples to apples because of population differences. Uh, per million. Yeah, so for example, Sweden has still done better. Remember, we used Sweden as an example for the longest period of time because we we're kind of dismayed the fact that they were not doing these stringent lockdown uh, mitigation strategies. And there's that. Case of the positive, there's the United States. All right, I am going to break protocol and I am going to go to our other graphs real fast. Let's go to our correlation graph. All right, here we are. Uh, da, da, da. The United States mortality rates are 2.147, which is actually very good. All right, I am going to continue breaking protocol. I am going to go to, that's our, if you want to look at it, that's our heat map. If you, I'm going to leave this up for a second. We're going to be obviously processing in 4K. Is there anything you want to look at right there? There it is. Just pause it, and hopefully it will come clear enough where you can actually read it. All right, world mask. Let's look at India. All right, I'll leave this up real fast. Here it is. Purple, cases per million, tests per thousands. You see the correlation? Oh, but hang on one second. I'm going to pause this for a second. And I am back. Only for a second. But here it is. India, you see, you notice a correlation between testing cases and so on and so forth. But this is actually the mass levels, which India has, obviously, again, it's a level four in the mass level. But however, though, like, enforcement's a whole different ballgame. Uh, this is the deaths per million. If you want to get a comparison to, for example, other places, it can definitely give you a different perspective. Uh, New Zealand, for example, I think they had their, they're starting to have outdoor concerts. Some, I think, 50,000 people, uh, one of the latest outdoor concerts. So New Zealand is pretty much there. So if anything happens, we'll follow that next week, even though most likely probably not. Uh, if I'm following patterns of other parts of the world that have had large gatherings. Uh, Japan, uh, da, da, da. Brazil, it seems to be ebbing and flowing. They had a pretty still scary deaths per million. So they're at 15 uh, per se. And let's say, for example, it's comparison. Let's look at India again. Uh, death per million, one. Now, I really want you to think, for example, again, of how the media has portrayed India and the actual data. And this is probably what disturbs me the most. I understand the idea of sensationalism, but at the same time, too, abject fear and terror and things that influence policies uh, not in favor of a population as a whole is akin to shouting fire in a movie theater. My personal opinion. All right. So let's move on to, let's go up, and I don't think there's any further information here that we need to review real fast. Again, please forgive me because of my time constraints. Yeah, just that mass level four, Solomon, Vanatu, Tonga, these are your mass level ones. Remember, one is recommended to in certain areas. Sweden, still two. And, but how accurate really truly is this if it's up? Again, United States are four. And the map we showed real fast, most of the states really we had were um, looking at it real fast. I grab this button. Yeah, if you look at it, seriously, load and no restrictions. So again, I really, really adore Oxford University now, World and Data. But however, though, you need to do some different uh, uh, data measuring because obviously you can't consider the United States of four if that's the case. So to proceed. All right, let's close out this one. Boom, boom, that's mass, good heat map, da, 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 nothing else is there. Hospital occupancy, real fast. Different data sources. Uh, seriously, not really much change. If we look at, you know, look at all these factors. Now, I did use this data source. I think health data got gov as our, as our aspect, the API on the uh, vaccine effectiveness as far as looking at uh, admission rates and for those people in data analytics you want to pull off basically previous day admission adult confirmed you pull off that column and then you sum it and that should give you a, a good information as far as all of the hospital admissions that we had and i think two million plus so i showed you all right here it is uh alaska uh, otherwise you'll end up with a convoluted data frame california 
spike, boom, 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 down. Actually pretty low, even lower than it was last year. But yet we're still on lockdown measures. New York, Florida. Remember how the world was supposed to come to an end for Florida? And they're almost laughing at the rest of the United States. And people are waiting in anticipation for Florida to fall after January. And it didn't. Again, correlation, causation, controls. Uh, you gotta, we have to drop the superstition. Doesn't mean that the superstitious are not going to be right every once in a while. But overall, uh, we have to start interjecting some non bias science. However, though, no mask use. Iowa, these are the states that basically drop the mask mandates. Are you noticing any difference? You notice they all begin to look the same. All right, here we go. And let's go to this one. Vaccine effectiveness. I did not include the Johnson, Johnson, AstraZeneca as of yet because the recalls, the problems, so on and so forth, and it would have not made a tremendous difference. But if, if vaccine with delivery was perfect by April 24, 2021, this is the percentage of the population of each state that should be vaccinated. And then I think I'll uh, rebuild. That is all we have for tonight. Let's review our information. Vaccine effectiveness. Five days remaining. And President Biden's 100-day promise. 100 days to mass, not forever, but 100 days. All right, this is our numbers needed to vaccinate to prevent one hospitalization. This is my data. It is very linear. Uh, the model is not perfect by far, but again, if you could develop a better model, please do it because no one else is. So 1,731 individuals to vaccinate in order to prevent one hospitalization based upon the percentage of people being hospitalized per infected at 6.7%. Absolute risk reduction, uh, number needed to vaccinate, working off phase three trial data, 119 people need to be vaccinated to prevent one infection. Uh, that could be asymptomatic or not asymptomatic. Uh, people may not even know they have or are positive, but that's what it is to prevent one. Again, and the data we're looking at is right here. Uh, per se, and again, to review the data in the articles itself, let's go forward to backwards. So here we are. This is what we're looking at, COVID-19, vaccine efficacy, and effectiveness, the elephant not in the room. Published April 20th, 2021. How many of you heard of this article, just out of curiosity, in the news? To proceed. What is numbers needed to vaccinate? I'll link this article, very educational. Uh, Wikipedia, you need to do something about your explanation. Uh, supplementary data, again, this information is in the supplementary data, which is going to be right there, a supplementary material. All right, relative risk and absolute and attack factors and everything else like that, that all NAH has some great information, or NCBI, I should say, great information in reference to that. Um, MIT, again, give credit where credit's due. CNBC, with the original interview, in reference to basically uh, MIT challenging indoor occupancy and distancing rules. Then followed by the Daily Mail, with its quite amusing random pop-ups. Limited capacity of bars and restaurants is nothing to cut the risk of COVID-19, new research claims. Again, interesting because what you're looking at is actually the same article being reviewed, but different headlines. And then that will link you to the information right here. Very detailed. Again, very detailed. Not an argument against masks. It is an argument against the hypothesis of indoor occupancy and distancing. So I want to be respectful, regardless of how I feel about them. I don't want to add more dimensions than the authors intended. And then the best data in this particular thing, in my personal humble opinion, is going to be in the supplemental material. Not because I find math beautiful. Actually, I used to love watching people do uh, formulas and things like that because when they just do it smoothly and all comes together to me personally it's like art but then I digress that's me uh, but how are though here and it gives the exact information but it gives a almost a little bit better explanation than uh, here per se and but again all the information is there and next time I see you let's see if this gentleman 
abides by his promise. Again, Ralph Giano signing off once again. Oh, I had this open the entire time. I should have closed that. Da da da. Da da. There, now it's bigger screen. Again, Ralph Giano signing off once again. Gratitude. Thank you for watching and look forward to see you all once again next week, which it should be quite interesting. And if we do not get censored in any way, shape, or form, which we haven't, except for one video, and that was a video on Ivermectin. So, again, as much as we like to bemoan a lot of the social media aspects and so on and so forth, we have not had any problems with fact checkers, nor have we had any problems with censorship since that one time uh, in Ivermectin. And that was it. But again, thank you, gratitude, humbly. Any information or uh, questions, uh, please forgive me. Sometimes I have a difficult time getting back because I am so, I, I do a, a lot of this in different venues. But in any case, I really, really, really do appreciate you watching. It does make a difference and pass this information on uh, to those which you think, well, pass it on, please, period, if you get an opportunity. Not because I'm looking for views. This, we don't make any money on this because we're not monetized. But if we can help somebody or help give someone a different direction or an angle, especially schools, and should kids be vaccinated again, uh, again with the vaccine, which has a, such an incredible um, – interesting uh, uh, dynamic. Again, that is up to society to basically make that call. Gratitude. Thank you. And I'll see you all next time. See you next time. Bye-bye-bye.